In the previous episode of the Isla Project, we discussed the definition of parasitism as well as the characteristics that describe most parasites. We looked at three of the six parasitic exploitation strategies and illustrated them using model organisms from the planet Isla. In part two, we will look at the remaining three strategies, these being trophically transmitted parasitism, parasitoidism, and micropredation. As we examine the last two, take note of how they both resemble and differ from the classical definition of parasitism that I presented in the previous episode. Like all concepts in biology, this classification exists as a spectrum, and there will always be species which push the boundaries of our understanding of any given classification. In this episode, we will examine three different organisms, each from drastically different environments and each with their own unique means of living as parasites on such a bizarre planet. This is the Isla Project. For our example of trophically transmitted parasitism, that is, a parasite that's transmitted through the feeding of the host, we turn our focus toward the windswept, rain-soaked mudflats of Isla's coast. Here dwells a microscopic organism known as Schistomyces chrysochroma. This tiny creature's eggs are partially motile and commonly dispersed in the sedimentary layers of the intertidal zone. In order for the parasite to proceed with its life cycle, these eggs must be eaten by a larger consumer, such as our model host species, Scelidarda arenicolis. These hard-shelled organisms trawl through the muck of the coastline, picking out algae and other small invertebrate-like organisms from the mud with a pair of highly dexterous mouths. Inevitably during the feeding process, Arenicolis consumes one or more of the microscopic Schistomyces eggs, which travel into its digestive tract. Here they hatch, releasing a tiny second-stage parasite. This worm-like stage has a large scolex, an attachment organ which allows them to latch onto and navigate the internal anatomy of the host. Their insides primarily consist of an enormous reproductive tract, which allows them to multiply at a rapid pace. Such anatomy is common in parasites, as nutrient intake is easier with a host and thus they can allocate far more energy to rapidly reproducing. Schistomyces chrysochroma are hermaphroditic at this stage in their life cycle, meaning that they are capable of producing both male and female gametes, as well as self-fertilization. Before they begin to multiply, however, the parasite travels from the host's gut to their reproductive organ, located at the posterior end of their body. Taking root inside of it, they then begin to asexually reproduce, creating more and more progeny until the reproductive tubing of Scelidarda arenicolis is so full of parasites that it physically swells and changes in color. As a result of this, the host can no longer breed, yet another example of parasitic castration in addition to that which was presented in episode 2. When they begin to fill the reproductive organs of the host, the plethora of Schistomyces chrysochroma also begin to modify its behavior in order for them to transition onto the next stage of their life cycle and onto their primary host. With a commandeered nervous system, a helpless Scelidarda arenicolis is compelled to emerge from its location within the mud and to wander the surface of the beach leaving it highly exposed to predation. Its reproductive organ, once dull in color, is now bulging with countless vivid parasites, making it stand out in its environment. If the parasite gets its way, the vulnerable Scelidarda arenicolis will get spotted by a wandering predator, such as Dynapalix hematifera, which restlessly scours many of Isla's coasts in search of a meal. Without a second thought, this predator will snatch up the exposed arenicolis, crushing it in its jaws and digesting it. In doing so, the microscopic parasites are released from their home in the prey and into their definitive host. Now within its gut, they transition into a sexually reproductive stage of their life cycle where they breed with other consumed parasites and rapidly multiply. The parasites in the definitive host have little effect on its health and primarily digest some of the excess nutrients in its stomach on which they can subsist for a number of earth years. As they do so, they mass-produce and fertilize eggs, which travel down the digestive system and are eventually excreted in the host's feces. Here the parasitic life cycle begins anew, as the eggs slowly migrate down into the sediment of the coastline, lying in wait for another Scelidarda arenicolis to come by and eat them, unknowingly bringing about its own untimely demise.
Next, we'll look at parasitoidism, which is defined as an instance where a parasite lives in close association with its host, ultimately killing it as it develops through its life cycle. This differs from our classical definition of parasitism, as it breaks away from the notion that parasites non-lethally harm the creatures they infect, reducing their fitness instead of ending their lives. On Earth, parasitoidism is commonly observed among insects, particularly by wasps in the order Hymenoptera. Parasitoids use their hosts as a means of reproduction, often using their dead or paralyzed bodies to sustain their developing young, which then leave the host after they mature. In many cases, the larvae consume their host in a manner that sustains its life for as long as possible, avoiding the destruction of vital organs until the end of their development. In the wasp species Specious speciosus, adult females hunt northern American cicadas, searching in trees and bushes. When she finds one, the female will sting it, injecting a venom into its abdomen and paralyzing the helpless insect. Once the soon-to-be host has been subdued, it is carried off to a previously dug burrow. The cicada is then deposited at the bottom of the nest, and the wasp lays her eggs on it. Finally, she seals up the nest, trapping the paralyzed parasite inside. Within a few days, the eggs hatch and begin to consume the cicada, using it as a prolonged food source to sustain their development past the larval stage. In two weeks, they fully mature, emerging from the nest as adult wasps. Parasitoids vary among themselves in the degree to which they subdue their hosts. Some, like Specious speciosus wasps, are idiobionts, which means that they prevent the development of the host, typically using steroid molecules injected with the paralyzing toxin. Coinobionts, on the other hand, allow the host to go about its typical developmental and metabolic processes while being internally fed on by the young. Typically, idiobiont species are ectoparasites, while those with coinobiont strategies are endoparasites. On Isla, parasitoidism is observable in the species Femodactylus garrulus, a small gliding dercostrid native to Isla's southern spore forests. In its day-to-day -day life, it glides between the forest's characteristic fungal trunks, snatching up small aeroplankton as it goes. When it's ready to reproduce, however, Femodactylus garrulus displays behavior comparable to that of the aforementioned cicada killer wasp. When a female is ready to lay her eggs, she situates herself high up on a fungal trunk where she clings using a number of tiny hooks on her feet. From here, she uses dorsally facing eyes to scan the air below. Unlike some parasites, females of this species don't target specific hosts, instead they are more generalist and will go for any airborne organism that falls into an acceptable range of sizes. An adult Platyopter hoffmanni is a prime target, as they drift slowly along the mostly stagnant air of the forest and are very light in mass. When the female Femodactylus garrulus spots such a target, she dives from her position above, falling to an altitude just below the host. Here, she slows herself and then, gliding belly up, drifts underneath her prey. This position is advantageous for a couple of reasons. First, most potential hosts do not have downward-facing eyes, allowing for her to go unnoticed as she passes underneath. Secondly, unlike her prey, the female has ventral eyes on both her abdorostral and distothoracic ends, allowing for her to focus on her target as she glides below it, inverted. Thanks to these eyes being slightly far apart on her form, she is able to easily triangulate the location and trajectory of the moving creature. Femodactylus garrulus are not capable of active flight and behave more comparably to the gliding squirrels of Earth. This means that it's difficult for the female to give chase if she misses her prey, and so she must be as accurate as possible on the first pass. Once locked onto her prey from below, the gliding female uses her momentum to circle up behind it. From here, she can overtake it, and using a pair of strong oral arms, she can snatch it out of the air. The tips of these appendages are coated in a potent neurotoxin, which paralyzes the prey and puts it into a sustained, coma-like state. She carries her newly subdued catch to a pre-selected fungal trunk, in which she has previously bored a hole. Here, she climbs to the opening and deposits the helpless host, and she lays a clutch of eggs onto it. Here they will sit and develop for approximately 14 Earth days. Their mother is long gone at this point, however soon they will hatch, and while in vulnerable and flightless stages of their lives, consume the tissues of the host implanted with them in the hole. Eventually they mature to the point where they can leave the nest. 
Crawling out of the hole their mother made roughly three Earth weeks before, they cling onto the fungal trunk and take off into the dimly lit air of the spore forest. Finally, we have the strategy of micropredation, where an animal travels from host to host, benefiting off each but generally having a lesser impact on their individual fitness. Micropredation differs from our classical definition of parasitism as it diverges from the idea that a parasite only infects a singular host during any given stage of its life cycle and maintains an intimate and durable relationship throughout. It is for this reason that micropredators are not considered conventional or true parasites, and instead sit somewhere in between classifications of consumer resource interaction. As we've demonstrated with Schistomyces chrysochroma, parasites can move between host organisms as they progress through development. However, when it comes to micropredation, a single adult organism can move between hosts throughout its life. The most common examples from Earth are mosquitoes. Females from most species fly between hosts and draw small quantities of blood from each. Micropredators typically impact their host less than other parasites, as the ability to travel between multiple organisms allows them to take fewer resources from any given individual. For our example from Isla, let's shift our focus from the land to the sea, and take a look at the hemophagic species Hemophilius blandus, a tiny invertebrate organism which siphons blood from shallow water fish. For the most part, it is free swimming, relying on a wide body to propel itself through the water. However, when it finds a host, it latches onto their outside and pierces their skin with a long proboscis. Hemophilius blandus is very small in relation to its host, so its presence typically goes unnoticed by the fish. Once attached, the tiny parasite draws small quantities of blood from the fish's bloodstream. Typically, the hosts that Blandus targets belong to the clade Diplogastra, also known as aquatic eelworms. The diameter of the parasite's proboscis has specially evolved to pierce the tough skin of these species. After the host has been drained of a sufficient amount of blood, the creature detaches from it and moves to find another. Rarely attached for more than an Earth hour, the Haemophilius Blandus has a perfect window of time to suck nutrients from its host while being minimally susceptible to detection. If it overstays its welcome, it's not uncommon to see the host eelworm discover the parasite, proceeding to rip it off using its proboscis and consume it. Haemophilius blandus typically inhabits shallow, rocky areas of Isla's marine sand plains, and thus, they tend to prey on species that use these rocks for shelter. Between their time feeding and swimming, it's common to see them clinging to these algae-covered boulders, using a pair of dorsal eyes to look out for any passing targets. We will discuss this parasite's home in further detail in the next episode. In conclusion, parasitism is an extremely prevalent form of biological interaction on Isla, just as it is on Earth, and it's important to note that while parasites can cause negative pathology within host populations, they are not a harmful component of the ecosystem containing them. Parasites help to manage populations of other species, and environments with a high diversity of parasites are almost universally considered healthier than those with a lower diversity. That's all for this episode of The Isla Project. In the future, we will revisit parasitism. However, for now, it's time to move away from the topic and explore other aspects of the planet. Until next time.